this morning <coughs> into a file, a uh, folder on Canvas under the files section, a folder called PVH Valuation. <coughs> and both files will be relevant to our class today. So in particular, you're going to need in just a minute to have the file called Valuation Model PVH Start. So please download that <coughs> and have it ready to go in Excel because that's the basis for the valuation model. So what we're going to do in just a few minutes is I will start with the same file that you do, that Excel file, and we will build in class the forecast and the valuation of the company PVH, which will become a reusable valuation model. Your task for homework three coming up is basically wherever I end up at the end of class today, you must clone what I do and follow along. And basically, if you finish at the end of this class, you're done with most of homework three. You could technically upload. If not, you must get to that point by Monday at 10 a.m. Because where we end up today, we're going to pick up at that point on Monday, and then we're going to finish the model. <clears throat> so you must follow along. Two very important points. This is individual. If I find any collaboration, any sharing of files, you go to the Honor Council, and it's an XF on your transcript. Okay. No sharing allowed. No sharing of files, no helping each other create this. You must do this individually. I want to make this as clear. You and your collaborators are going to the Honor Council if you do otherwise. I can't have you guys basically look at the model as a black box. Like, I can give you the finished model, but if I give you the finished model, you have no idea why things work, and the only way that you're actually going to understand this very complex method is if you do it yourself. All right, so again, it's not that I'm trying to be difficult. It's actually to help you because for the rest of the semester, we're going to be using this model extensively. If you have trouble with anything on the video, see myself or the TAs, okay? Because this is very important that you create because this is the model you're going to use on homework assignments. This is the model you're going to use for your group project. And this is the model that's actually people use on Wall Street that have graduated from this class. They also use this in the SendBit Fund as part of the research that they do. So it's going to be a very real world model. You got to do it yourself. So the other thing, <clears throat> in order to make it a reasonable model, is the other part of homework three is the other assignment called PVH data. Okay? So this one will require Bloomberg. So here's the idea. In Bloomberg, <clears throat> go to PVH US equity, type FA. We need to basically get the data for our model in a common format. We're going to tie the model to Bloomberg. So if you go to FA and you go to the income statement tab, you'll see that Bloomberg has the standardized statements. And so what I need you to do is actually go to the custom tab and you're going to create a custom template. Okay? Now this template will be pick any company, open up this template, it'll export that company's data. So that's how we will quickly turn PVH into Costco or General Electric or Ford or Pfizer. Okay? So basically we're going to create a reusable template to export data into our reusable model, which is mapped to this template. And right? those are the two things that you need to do for homework three. So when you get to the custom template, make sure that you have the following settings in your individual Bloomberg account. Make sure number of periods is six. We're going to use six historical years, just arbitrarily. Model set up for that. On the data tab, make sure none of these things are checked because we only want the six historical years. Right, if we have on the other data, it's going to break our model. On the display tab, make sure the display order is ascending so that the most current year is on the right, not on the left. Very important to your model. And finally, under the report Excel tab, make sure it says export as value, not formula. Right? Because if you put in formulas and you leave the lab, it'll break. You won't have any data in your model anymore. So you'll need to make sure it says value. Then click update. Okay. Now, what we need to do is I posted again here to Canvas. This is the result file for PVH. So basically, that's this file. Now this is our map. Okay. Using this map, we're going to create a reusable template. And the key to the map is we need every piece of data from Bloomberg in this order in these exact fields. 
so that when we export data for any company, I need row 13 to be interest income, I need row 16 to be interest tax expense, I need row 22 to always be minority interest. If it's not that, it's going to break the model. And Bloomberg has many fields that are very similar to each other. So to make sure that we get the correct field, then this is the database field name, which Bloomberg does not change. This is the friendly name, which Bloomberg actually does change. So rely on this field to create your model. So this is an exercise that as part of your homework will probably take you 20 minutes, right? I know it's kind of rote. I know it's not a fun, but we got to do this one time. So here's what you're going to have to do to recreate this. Once you go to FA custom and create a new custom template in this enter field, easiest way to do this is copy and paste. So go to your Excel file, take cell B6, copy it, go here, enter field, paste it, select it. The very first one should match. To verify that it matches, if you hover over what's selected, a pop-up box will pop up. Or should pop up. There it is. And it'll give you the Excel field ID. That's what's got to match. Sales underscore rev underscore turn. Okay? So then, repeat. Cost of revenue. Copy. Field. Paste. Select. Gross profit. Make sure you get this one. Copy. Make sure you use the first one that matches. Verify by hovering. But you'll basically do this 74 times. Okay? Yes? Where did you get the best buy? Did it get to that? Where did you get what? You said to make sure these things are not checked. So under settings. This is what you got to check. Settings. All right. So make sure those ones I talked about are, are checked the way they're supposed to be. So back to this. <clears throat> so you'll create this template, which will match my template. I've already done this. And by the way, when you're done, save it and then give it a friendly name. I called mine model. You can call it whatever you want. I think up to 11 characters. And once you save it, it'll always be here on the top row. Okay. So here is your homework assignment. It's on L Brands, which is better known as Victoria's Secret. Okay. So basically, you type in L Brands or LB. Okay. Now, once you have created this template for PVH, you can come over here to your custom templates, click on the, the template. This was the model template. And then, voila, there is L Brands data that overwrites the PVH data in this format. Okay. What you're then going to do is you're going to export this to Excel. So you're going to bring it outside of Bloomberg into a format that we will use. Okay, it is this Excel data that we'll put into our model, and that's what makes the model reusable. And everything will be mapped to this exported template. Now, the final step is Excel chokes on dashes. Right? You can't have referenceable data to a dash in a formula. It just won't work. So for some reason, when Bloomberg has missing information, it just gives dashes. And we need them to be zeros. Now, I've asked Bloomberg's help desk several times if we can get rid of the dashes. They've never given me a way to do it. If anybody can actually figure out how to get Bloomberg to not export dashes, to export them as zeros, please let us know. It'll be a great tip for all of us. Otherwise, this final step is manual. In Excel, if you have Windows, <coughs> Control-C. If you have Mac, uh, Command-C. But take one of the dashes and copy it. Then either Control-F or Command-F for Find and then replace all of the dashes with zeros. Okay? And then save the file. File, save as. Again, I'll call this LB data. That is the first part of homework three. Okay? Yes? I don't know what's different than this, but if you tell me, I'll, I'm happy to upload the file again. But basically, this is the file. 
from the model. So tell me after class what's wrong and we'll get it fixed. But this is the file, this is the format that you need. Okay. Now, continuing on. So I'm going to kill this. Here's what's actually going to happen, and this is why this matters. <clears throat> so if you have it in the right format, the other file that we're going to go to is called Valuation PVH Start. Okay, so this is the model. The very first tab in this multi-tab model is this data. Okay, now this actually used to be Merck. Okay, now it says PVH. Right, but let's say we were doing L Brands. The process it doesn't really matter. So what we're going to do is I'll take L Brands as an example. Here's the L Brands data that we just exported. copy the whole tab. You're not going to do this today. But when we finish the PVH valuation and we reuse the model, paste special values, now our PVH model is the L Brands model. So it'll take us a couple classes to build the first model. It'll take you all the five minutes to do company number two and three and four and five. Every class after spring break, you'll be doing a different company. That's why it's so important to have this template and your group project will rely on this. So this is the reusable model. That's what we're going to do. Okay? So that's where we're heading with this. So that's the second part of the assignment, is we've got to build the reusable model. So I'm going to cancel out of this, just to make sure we're all starting with the same file. <coughs> A lot of files open. All right. So back to this. So let me just double check this. You're saying that you believe so it's not a problem. Okay, good. Uh, so here's the thing. We all need this file, valuation model PVH star. Now, right now, you're not copy and pasting any data into it. I already did that. All right, I took the, the PVH data export. I already put it into this model. Like I said, this was our Merck model from the end of last semester. All right, and I basically took the final model and I killed a bunch of stuff so that you don't have the complete model. But this is going to get us towards the complete model we're going to use over this semester. So I'll give you a summary. So basically what this raw data export from Bloomberg does is this is the income tab in the model. It recreates the historical income statements. And it recreates the historical balance sheets in a common format. Okay? Then, you would have appreciated this in the midterm, TFI tab, there's the converted TFI balance sheet that balances based on the standardized balance sheet. There is the next tab over is the converted TFI, TII, <clears throat> which balances the income statement auto-converted mapped. It's mapped. And that's the key to the model, is we're not hard-coding things in. We're using relative references. So when the new data comes in, that's the actual TII for PVH. And the more important one, which you would appreciate in the midterm, is here's your CFI. Balanced and <clears throat> matched for the six years automatically. Okay. Now, here's the thing. It happens to balance for PVH, but on the off chance, and this is very important, that you work on a new company, you should always, once you put the historical data in, go to the CFI tab, see if it balances. If it doesn't, we have a problem. And the problem usually stems from Bloomberg because we're dealing with the real world. And let's say a company has an accounting number that's just crazy that they threw out that didn't exist in Bloomberg's database. Bloomberg has to put it in their database, which means it's going to break our model because we're relying on the Bloomberg maps of their fields, which if they update, then we're going to miss something and then the statements aren't going to balance. So this will happen in maybe 2% of the projects that we do. It won't happen in your homework assignments, but for those 27 group projects, it could happen to you. And so what we would have to do in that case is we had to figure out what was added. We'd have to make sure it's added correctly into our income statement or balance sheet and flows through those other statements. Okay, otherwise we have an invalid model. So this shouldn't happen very often, but I can't tell you in the real world that new stuff doesn't happen. Or, worst case scenario, Bloomberg for some reason decides to change one of their data inputs. So instead of using one field, they flip it to another field. So they just change it from time to time. So this is a good way to find out that we have a model that's valid because if it balances, you're probably in good shape. If it doesn't balance, you know you're missing something. Now, next, this is the auto-converted economic profits based on beginning of year and end of year, which again, also balance. And more importantly, 
five-year historical graph of ROIC, but there's an ROIC drivers, which is the tree. So last week when we talked about the tree, this auto creates the historical tree that we'll be doing the analysis on. So again, <laughs> nice feature of the model, you get to do it manually, it's done automatically. Right? So I've given you all this, the history as a starting point, so we're not starting with a complete blank sheet of paper. And what we're going to now do is we're going to create a forecast because to do evaluation, we need forecast cash flows. So in a second, you're going to follow along with me to take this file, start building in the forecast. Right? Now, a couple more best practices, a couple other tabs. There's a tab called assumptions. As we create our forecast, <laughs> some of the key assumptions in our forecast are going to be on the assumptions tab. Best practice number one. We don't want to scatter assumptions throughout our model. All right, if you have a very complex model with multiple tabs and you reuse it and you accidentally forget that you made a change in a tab, you might actually cause a problem because you're like, this data doesn't make any sense because somewhere on tab number six, you change something and it's hard coded and you forgot to update it and it gets very frustrating. So best practice number one, make uh, the changes in as few places as possible. So we're going to aggregate all the assumptions in one tab. Number two, because we want this to be a reusable model, look at the income tab. <clears throat> You'll see that revenue is not hard coded. Revenue is going to model data <coughs> I6. So that way when we export from Bloomberg, import it in, it auto sources and carries through the model. I don't want to accidentally change that field. Because if I change that field, it's going to break the model. So I'm going to be very careful about what I change in my Excel file. So a number of years ago, I chose the color yellow. And you could choose whatever you want, but I chose yellow to highlight to me that this is okay to change. Like this is not going to screw up my model, and these are the assumptions that I make. So best practice number one, minimize where all your assumptions are, assumptions tab. Best practice number two, highlight or make unchangeable, like if you want to protect worksheets or cells, things that can't be changed versus can be changed. But even if you protect things, I find it easier to highlight. That's why I pick a different color if you want, but I pick yellow so I know this is something that's changeable and I'm looking to change it. All right, question? Um, so like I saw in all the other statements that there were dashes, so we shouldn't change those. Where do you see dashes? Like on the income. In the model, oh, yeah. that's okay. okay. But in this tab, not okay. Because what will happen is if you try and put this into a formula, it's actually going to die. Right? If, if Excel already has a formula and then shows the result as a dash, it's okay. Because right? this is a formatting thing. But the actual number behind the format can't be a dash. Okay? But good point. Now, back to this. Here's what I mean by assumptions. PDH, you can see this in the model, has already reported fiscal 2017, right? PVH is about to report fiscal 2018, which their fiscal year ends in January, in end of March, March 26 or something like that. So if as a reusable model, when we get a new year here and the last year is 2018, then what we're gonna do is just we're gonna update our model to 2018 as the last historical year and then everything will auto adjust. That's what I mean by an assumption, okay? or for example, we have a WAC, which instead of 8% is 8.3%. So we just type in the WAC, it just rolls it out throughout the whole model. So that's the idea. So the assumptions page are universal assumptions that will go throughout the whole model. The other area, the other tab, which we're going to change, and this is where we're about to start, is called the ratios tab. So these are the historical income statement and balance sheet ratios for PVH. Everything is a percentage of sales, with the one exception being the revenue growth rate, which is a percentage change. Right? So, best practice for forecasting, we forecast the ratios, which creates the for forecasted statements. So here's where we begin. <clears throat> this is six years of history. We're going to forecast six years. I've chosen six years arbitrarily. Okay? Could have chosen ten years, could have chosen eight years, I just chose six. Right? Now, five years are what are called the defined period, which means we year by year forecast for five years. And then year six is the beginning of the continuing value period, also known as the terminal value period. You always forecast n plus one years. So the n plus one is continuing value. So if I say six years, 
five years defined, six years beginning and continuing value. If I say 10 years, nine years defined, year 10 is beginning and continuing value. So whatever you forecast, always forecast a plus one year, which is your continuing value assumption year. So <clears throat> in this case, we're going to forecast six. Now I need it to be a relative model so that as I change it, it auto updates. And to make it easier, just because my screen is a little squeezed because of this old projector, I'm going to hide, you don't have to do this, I'm just doing it so you can see it, a few of the columns. If you choose to hide, hide, don't delete, because you'll screw up the entire model. Okay, So I'm just hiding the columns so you can see what I'm about to do more clearly. So first forecast year for PVH equals previous year plus one. Again, we don't want to hard code in 2018, because when it changes, it won't auto update. So equals previous year plus one. Next, we've got to forecast the revenue growth rate. So here's the placeholder we're going to use, equals previous year. And then I'm going to make this cell yellow to tell me that this is something that I could change. Okay, so last year they grew 2.3%. 2018 is a placeholder, they're going to grow 2.3%. Okay, now if they grew 2.3%, I go to the income tab. This is my historical income statements, and I'm going to basically label the forecast statements, because I have a lot of years and I want to know which ones are history and which ones are forecast. Again, relative year plus one. And for revenue, and again, I'm going to hide a few columns, just so it's easy to see what I'm about to do. So for revenue equals previous year revenue times left per n one plus the growth rate from the ratios, H2, right print. And then I'm going to take all of this and I'm going to format this as dollars to one decimal place and make it a little bit wider so it doesn't have a problem. So here's the point. If PVH were to grow 2.3%, revenue would be 8390.1. Now we're not going to do this today. This will be next week. But let's say we think PVH is going to grow 5%. 8613.3. Let's say PVH is going to go 1%. 8285.1. Let's say PVH is going to shrink 3%. 79.57. So this is what I mean, is that we'll use the ratios to create the statements. So eventually we'll focus on what's the right ratio, but for now we're just going to leave a placeholder and to make sure we all build a common spreadsheet that matches don't do what I just did. Just leave it as equals the previous year. That's our placeholder as we build the model. Make sense? Questions? What yes. The formula that you had? <coughs> so <coughs> growth rate is previous year times 1 plus the growth rate. We'll get you the this year's growth rate. Okay? Just algebra. All right. Next. Here's the thing. I highlighted kind of in gray the most important things to forecast. And the next item we're going to forecast is EBITDA. We're going to skip the intermediate, intermediate variables. So <clears throat> EBITDA and revenue growth are going to be two of the most important variables that we forecast. Now here's the thing. If this were real and you go to a company and you're dealing with PVH, they're going to want to know about your forecast for cost of goods sold and they're going to want to know about your forecast for SG&A. But to be honest with you, it doesn't matter the valuation because it's going to lead to an EBITDA, a cash margin for the business. And the model doesn't care. So in the real world, we'll be more granular. But practically, we don't need to forecast the two because we're going to get to an EBITDA number, and that's what really matters. So rather than forecasting two numbers, we're just going to forecast the number that matters directly. Now, that creates a forecast implicitly for the other two. But basically, we're going to format forecast EBITDA rather than forecasting cost of goods sold and SG&A separately. Okay? Next, we're going to forecast depreciation. So therefore, equals the previous year. Placeholder, make that yellow. But then, operating income or EBIT, we solve for. Equals EBITDA minus DA. Because here's the point. I don't want to <coughs> basically forecast operating income, because operating income is a result of the previous two. Okay. So what we could have done is we could, could have forecasted EBITDA, we could have forecasted operating income, we could have solved for depreciation. 
We could have forecasted operating income and depreciation. We could have backed into an EBITDA, right? I am choosing that we will forecast EBITDA and back into operating income, okay? But that's the point. We'd have to make a choice, but I'm telling you, this is a good choice. So that's what we're going to do. Questions about what I just did. That's why operating income is not yellow. It's a result. That's EBIT. Okay. Next, we need to forecast a tax rate. We need a representative tax rate. Now, next week, one of the things we could have talked about is we could have said, okay, we got six years of historical tax rates. We can use that as a guide for the tax rate of the company. Right? Take, maybe even take an average unless there's an outline. But we can't do that anymore. Why would using the last six years of tax rates be a bad idea? Why is it not representative? Because the tax rate in the U.S. just went 35 to 21. So this is what I mean by the past doesn't always predict the future. If we use the past as a guide, we're going to be crazy wrong because the tax environment just completely changed. And this isn't just true for PVH. This is true for any U.S. company. So that's why I say it's important to think about the, the ratio itself than just to use historical averages, which some people do. So how do we do this? Again, preview of next week. So in Bloomberg, we're not the only people that are dealing with this. Every analyst on Wall Street is trying to do the same thing. So in Bloomberg, I think they showed this to you, but if you go to EVT, this is the event calendar for a company. This is L Brands. So let me switch this to PVH. PVH. So here's PVH. Here's their event calendar. This is all the major corporate events, including like the Goldman Sachs, uh, or is it Goldman Sachs Global Retail Conference, or the quarterly earnings release for the third quarter? Like this is actually the third, the fourth quarter conference call, which is their end of year. This is where the analysts will actually go to get the PIN number. But the point is, cool feature of Bloomberg. As soon as the third quarter calls over, you come over here. They have an audio, but more importantly, they give you a written transcript. So literally within a minute or two of the call ending, you can actually go to Bloomberg and they'll get a transcript of the call which will be a PDF document. We can search this PDF document, and one of the things you'll typically find in the quarterly annual call is the guidance for the tax rate. Because the analysts are gonna be dealing with the same thing we do. So in this case, Mike Schaefer, their CFO, gave the analyst guidance on what he thought they should use for their tax rate for 2018. So that's actually gonna be more representative next week when we actually do finish PVH with real data. But we're not doing that right now because today we're just putting in a placeholder as we build the common model. Okay? Questions about what I'm doing? Where we're eventually going to end up? Preview? Yes? So when we do for that L, L, L Brands? Yeah, L -Brands. For now, L Brands, you're not doing any of this. You're just exporting the raw data file. You're not doing evaluation of L Brands, and I'll give you the word yet. But if you can guess what homework five is going to be, Right? I have a feeling that it might involve a company called L Brands. Right? But that's not homework three or homework four. Homework three and four are let's finish PVH first. Okay? Now, continuing on, we got to solve for a no plan. Because again, we know the operating income, we have a guess of the tax rate. We don't do this independently, it's based. So no plan equals operating income times left paren one minus the tax rate. Or, if you go to G10, you can see that formula from the previous year, copy and paste it over. Okay. Again, questions about any of that. All right, continuing on, net operating gains and losses equals previous year. Again, we'll make that yellow. So what I then want to do is I want to take 2018, copy it, and paste it over to 2023, which is column M. So basically, we're just moving this out six years. Now, here's the thing. Don't drag. Okay? And here's why. If you drag, every now and then, Microsoft, in its way to try and be helpful to you, will say, oh, you're dragging. You must, try, you must be trying to create a series. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a series for you. 
right? And then your model's not going to balance. You're going to be like, what the hell happened? And Microsoft, in its friendly way, had done something that you weren't aware of where you thought you were just copying, and it said in dragging, you're creating series, and it creates a series, but it doesn't tell you it created a series. So it's going to happen to you one out of every 25 times. But that one out of 25 times is going to make you go crazy about why your model doesn't balance. So here's my point. Copy, paste. Right? It's, it's easier to do the drag, but I'm telling you, you sometimes you don't want to do things because it will actually make your life more difficult later. Consider that a pro tip. So copy, paste. Okay. Now, <clears throat> continuing on, I want to go to my income statement. And we need to start finishing off these ratios. So back to EBITDA. We forecasted EBITDA. We're going to skip the intervening variables. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take for 2018 from the ratios tab, 2018 EBITDA is a percentage of revenue, H6, times income tab, H3, which is the 2018 revenue, 1136.3. Next, we're going to do depreciation equals from the ratios tab, 2018 forecast depreciation, H7, times income tab, 2018 forecast revenue, H3. Now, you can look over here on the left, pluses, minuses. EBITDA minus DA is operating income or EBIT, therefore equals EBITDA minus DA, 807.2. Yes. So ratios, EBITDA is a percentage of sales, H6, times that forecasted income revenue number, H3. Same idea. Is the ratios is the percentage of sales times the forecasted dollar income amount. That gives my dollar forecast. We're going to be doing that a lot for the next 20 or so minutes. Okay. So again, result operating income. So you guys should all get 807.2. Next, interest expense. One of the things that you should have read in the book, or if you didn't buy the book, you're just trying to figure it out as we go along, what the book would have told you, um, is basically... When we do an enterprise DCF, we assume a target and non-changing capital structure. For our purposes, we're going to assume the, key, the capital structure is the non-changing capital structure. That will just be a question on the midterm. I'll assume you know how to answer. So basically, <clears throat> here's the thing. Since we're not changing the capital structure, we're using a constant whack, then we're not going to worry about changing debt or interest expense. Plus, you're going to quickly realize it's irrelevant to the valuation. So interest expense equals the previous year. Interest income, yes. Ratio is 8.6 times income H3. So for interest expense equals previous year. For interest income equals previous year. Again, it won't matter to the valuation, but we're just going to assume since the capital structure is not changing, the interest won't change. And for interest income, again, we're just going to leave the interest income alone. Okay, we're not going to change how companies invest their short-term cash. All right. Next, foreign exchange gains and losses, zero. We can't predict with certainty what the FX rates are going to be in the future. So we're not going to try. And we're going to assume that companies will generally be smart about hedging in some way. So basically, FX gains and losses, zero. Income or loss from affiliates equals the previous year. If they got gains or losses from affiliated income, then we're just going to leave it alone. Again, you're going to quickly find this doesn't affect the valuation, but we want to look like we have an income statement that adds up. And then finally, non-operating gains and losses equals, from the ratios tab, 2018 non-operating gains and losses, H11, times, from the income tab, forecasted 2018 revenue, H3. And then we solve for pre-tax income. So operating income minus interest expense plus interest income minus FX minus income or loss from affiliates minus non-operating losses or gains. But here's the thing. If you go over to G16, 
I had to do that historically. So you can just copy G16 to G17 if you want to be lazy. If you don't want to be lazy, then basically start here using those pluses and minuses, get to there. Okay, so pre-tax income, 692.2. Next, income tax expense equals, from the ratios tab, we're going to forecast the tax rate. Right now it's 18.6%. And then we're going to multiply that tax rate, income, by the pre-tax income, which is H17 or H16. And that's going to get us 128.8 in taxes, which is going to get us income before extraordinary items equals pre-tax income minus taxes, 563.3. Next, extraordinary loss net of tax, zero. The key word is extraordinary. By definition, extraordinary things are one time and shouldn't happen in the future. And we can't forecast extraordinary events in the future, so we're not going to. So we're going to treat them truly as one time and therefore zero in the future. Okay? <clears throat> so net income before minority interest, just to have the math work, income before extraordinary items minus the extraordinary loss, then we get to minority interest. Whatever minority dividends the company is paying, we're going to leave alone. In this case, they're not actually paying dividends, they're actually requiring payments from the minority partners of whatever it is, $300,000. But the point is, whatever minority distributions the company's doing, we're going to leave them alone, we're going to keep them current, not change the capital structure, equals previous year. Therefore, that gets us net income. You can see the formula here equals net income before minority interest minus minority interest, and that will get us our net income, 563.6. Questions? All right, continuing on. Cash dividends equals the previous year. We're not going to try and forecast a change in dividend policy. So whatever dividends, if they had preferred dividends, they're going to keep paying them. So equals the previous year. Other adjustments, zero. These are accounting changes required by FASB as they make changes to GAAP. They typically don't affect cash flow, but they do, cra do crazy things to financial statements. So here's the point. We don't know what the proclamations are going to be. We don't know what the impacts of the proclamations are going to be. And realistically, they don't matter to anybody except for the accountants because it has zero impact on cash flow. So therefore, other adjustments from our perspective, zero. Net income available to common shareholders equals net income minus cash preferred dividends plus other adjustments. But here's a little trick. In Bloomberg, and PVH doesn't pay preferred dividends, if you look at G25, you'll see that I'm adding in preferred dividends even though this is a minus sign. Here's why. Because dividends are coming from the cash flow statement, not the income statement, the format that Bloomberg is giving us is dividends will show up as a negative number. Right? So if we take the formatted negative number for preferred dividends and we subtract it, it'll be like adding it. Okay? And that's just because I know that that's how Bloomberg reports it. So even though it says net income minus cash preferred dividends, we're going to, and that's why you can actually take cell G25 and copy it over. Because I know that the preferred dividends are going to come as a negative format. I'm adding the negative number. Other adjustments are a positive number, subtracting them to get to net income to common shareholders. Okay? Dividends paid equals previous year. This is what I mean. Common dividends come from Bloomberg as a negative number, not a positive number. So for change in retained earnings, I would normally subtract the dividends, but because it's coming as a negative number, equals net income available to common shareholders plus the negative dividend pays. Okay? Now, if Bloomberg were to ever change its formatting, we'd have to adjust our model. But that's the point of Bloomberg. They generally don't because there's a lot of banks that do exactly what we do. And so therefore, Bloomberg doesn't like to change things because it screws up a whole lot of people. Okay. So again, 551.4. That's the number you need to get to.
Okay, now for the easy part. Take what you did for 2018, take the whole column and copy it, select all the columns to M, as in Mary, paste it, and we now have a forecast through 2023 of an income statement based on the ratios, because we had already copied the forecasted ratios forward. Then go to TII, take 2017 TII, copy it, go to column M, paste it. We now have a forecasted balancing TII through 2023 relative years equals previous year plus one. Copy it through. So we just finished TII. So very quickly in about 20 minutes, <clears throat> what we have done is we've basically forecasted six years worth of income statements for the ratios. We created six years worth of TII and now we're ready to move on to the balance sheet. So here's a number to check, 740.1. That should be your final TII. Questions? Yes? How did I get it to do what? I Don't drag. So select the column by clicking on G. Right click on a mouse to copy. Select H while holding down the mouse through M, right click, paste. Then cells H1 equals previous year plus one. Copy, paste. Told you guys at the beginning of the semester, if you didn't know Excel, you're gonna finish the semester knowing a whole lot more about Excel. <clears throat> All right, next, <clears throat> we're gonna do the balance sheet. So we just finished the income statement. Now we're going to do the balance sheet. So let's go back to the ratios. All of these nine balance sheet ratios that I've chosen for us to forecast are as a percentage of sales. This is a percentage of 2017 sales. Now best practice, as talked about in the book, it basically says ideally you want to forecast the balance sheet based on the income statement driver. So for example, accounts receivable should be based on revenue, but inventory should be based on cost of goods sold. But practically, if we do everything as a percentage of revenue, we'll still end up in the same place, right? And more importantly, if we do everything as a percentage of revenue, when we change revenue, it actually changes the entire balance sheet, which you're going to find a little bit later actually makes your life a lot easier. So here's the point. Right now, as a percentage of revenue, this is our forecast equal the previous year as a placeholder. Make it yellow and then copy it and paste all this down to M21 so that basically we have six years worth of numbers. Now you could have gone straight down and copied it over, but the point is we want six years of ratios that just equal the previous year. All yellow. Questions? Now we're going to go through the balance sheet. So <clears throat> Here is the balance sheet. So let's start creating. And again, I'm going to hide some years just so it's easier to see it all on one page. We're going to start creating the forecasted balance sheet. Equals previous year plus one. Now, <clears throat> when we do the balance sheet, we just had nine of these items as a percentage of sales. So we're going to quickly reference those nine items. So start with the ratios. The first one's accounts and notes receivable. So here's how it's going to work. I'll go to accounts and notes receivable, which is H6 equals from the ratios tab H13, which is the 2018 accounts and notes receivables as percentage of revenue forecast, times from the income tab H Three, which is the 2018 revenue forecast. That would get me 630.04 million 
of accounts and notes receivable. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of this. Forecast this as currency one decimal place just to match, but I basically have 630 million of receivables. Okay, repeating. The next one is inventory. Equals from the ratios tab. Inventory is a percentage of sales, 16.1 times income tab, 2018 revenue. Other current assets, you're going to find a similar pattern. Equals, ratios, other current assets as a percentage of revenue, so that's H15, times income tab, 2018 forecasted revenue, H3. Next, long-term investments. <coughs> Equals, ratios, long-term investments in receivables as a percentage of revenue, times income, 2018 revenue. Net fixed assets equals ratios, 2018 net fixed assets as a percentage of sales, times income, 2018 revenue. Goodwill, skip. Next one is long term assets equals ratios, 2018 other long term assets, times Income 2018 revenue forecast. Accounts payables, the next one, equals ratios 2018 accounts payable times income 2018 revenue. Other short term liabilities equals ratios 2018 other short term liabilities times income revenue. And finally, other long-term liabilities equals ratios H21 times income H3. So we've now forecasted those nine balance sheet items as a percentage of revenue very quickly for 2018. We now have to finish the balance sheet so that it balances and more importantly does not have a circular reference. A circular reference is a flawed, invalid model. You should never trust a model with a circular reference in it. So you are not allowed to have one in this class. So back to this. I'm going to show you how to get the balance sheet to balance without a circular reference with a forecast. So here's how we're going to do this. <clears throat> we're going to start by finishing off equity. Start out with preferred shares equals previous year. All right, since we're not changing the capital structure, whatever preferred stock, they're just going to keep. Okay, Minority interest, same principle. If they have any minority shareholders, they're going to keep their minority shareholders. They're not going to add or subtract minority shareholders. We're going to leave that constant. Share capital equals previous year. We're not going to issue or repurchase stock. Right? We're going to leave it whatever it is. But the one thing we are going to change is retained earnings. So we need to know what the new retained earnings balance is going to be. So here's how we forecast it. So for H30 equals previous year's retained earnings plus from the income tab, the 2018 change in the retained earnings. <clears throat> so that's what the retained earnings should be at the end of 2018. So it's the 17 retained earnings plus base of the income statement, whatever the retained earnings change should be, that becomes your new retained earnings balance. So 2405.8. And if I sum those four equity accounts, then I get my total equity of 5357.9. Okay, so we leave the first three equity items constant. And then we basically solve for retained earnings by taking the previous year, G30, plus income H27, which is the change in retained earnings that we're forecasting on our 2018 income statement. Income minus dividends. Okay. 
Now, finishing up the liabilities and equity, we'll start out with short-term borrowings. Short-term borrowings equal the previous year. Since we're not changing any of the capital structure, we're leaving the debt alone. We left the interest alone. We're leaving the short-term debt alone. So equals previous year. So therefore, our total current liabilities are the sum of those three items. Sixteen hundred. So H eighteen to H twenty. Long term borrowings equals the previous year. That's your long term debt. We're going to leave it alone. Pension liabilities equal the previous year. The pension liabilities are not going to change. Under U.S. law, companies are not allowed to have long term pension deficits. So basically, whatever pension they have is fine. We're going to assume anything else will be NPV zero. And most companies are going to 401ks anyways. So basically, we'll leave the pension, but we're not going to grow the pension. Okay? So equals the previous year. Add up our long-term liabilities. So you can just add or sum those three items, long-term borrowings, other long-term liabilities, and pension. And we get long-term liabilities of 4728.7, which gets us total liabilities, current plus long-term, 6328.8. Liabilities and equity equals the 6328.8 plus the equity. So 11,686.7. So that's the forecast for liabilities and equity on the balance sheet for PVH in 2018. Now it's very important that our balance sheet balance. Because if we don't have a balance sheet that balances, it's going to cause all sorts of problems in the model. So I'm going to show you how to get your balance sheet to balance. Very simple trick. Take your total assets equals total liabilities and equity. There you go. Now your balance sheet balances. Okay? So that was really easy. Right? But practically, we now need all the assets to add up to this amount. So that creates the concept of what's known as a plug. We're going to have to solve for something to make sure all the assets add up to that number. The plug is excess cash. Right? So our plug is cash. So the, we'll solve for the cash that makes the balance sheet balance. That will become the cash flow for the firm. So here's the thing. We need every other item except for excess cash. So the next one is operating cash. Well, we had on the assumptions tab created an assumption universally for operating cash as a percentage of revenue. We're not going to change that year by year. It will always be that number. So here's how we're going to do it. For H4 equals, from the assumptions tab, operating cash as a percentage of revenue, B3, times income tab, H3. So our operating cash balance is 167.8. However, in Excel, when we copy and paste this, this is going to change this to C3, D3, E3, F3, etc. We don't want it to do that. We always want it to be B3. So in Excel, put a dollar sign, or what used to be called a string in front of the B, and a dollar sign or string in front of the 3, and that tells Excel to make B3 an absolute reference, which means wherever you copy to the model, it will always refer to that cell, and it won't do a relative copy. So, the final one is goodwill, equals the previous year. So here's the thing about goodwill. It's impossible to forecast acquisitions. So we can't do it, right? And even if we could, generally, at best, acquisitions are typically NPV zero. In fact, the academic research says that the average acquisition is NPV negative, right? So the point is that they make an acquisition, they're probably going to have a close to an NPV zero proposition, so it's not going to affect the valuation anyways. Right? So nonetheless, we're not going to forecast new goodwill. In terms of goodwill itself, goodwill is now impaired. It's not amortized. And goodwill impairments have no cash impact, and more importantly, no tax impact. So therefore, even if the company writes off its goodwill, it won't change anything. Right? So basically, we're not going to change goodwill. We're just going to leave it where it is. And it won't change anything either because technically it could stay on your balance sheet forever. So once we've done that, the only non-summed item is excess cash. So here's how we solve for excess cash. Equals 
total assets minus everything else. Minus the operating cash, minus the accounts and notes receivable, minus the inventory, minus the other current assets, minus the long-term investments, minus the net fixed assets, minus the goodwill, and minus the other long-term assets, 1106.8. And very important, no circular reference. Okay. <clears throat> so now we can just sum up the current assets, add everything above those five items. Now we can sum up the long-term assets Add the four items above from long-term investments, net fixed assets, goodwill, and other long-term assets. And if we want to do a check to make sure we didn't make a mistake, take our current assets plus our long-term assets, and you'll notice these two numbers match. So we have a balancing balance sheet where everything actually adds up because our plug was excess cash. Right? I'm going to get rid of this because I don't want that, but I'm just illustrating to you that we actually now have a balancing balance sheet. And all the items actually add up, and more importantly, there's no circular references in your model. Questions about anything I just did? Because we're in the home stretch now for today. So now, take 2018, copy that column, go to column M, Right click, paste, and we now have a forecasted balancing balance sheet through 2023. Then go to TFI. Yes? The operating cash will change because it's a percentage of revenue. So it should be going up 2.3% a year. Because it's 2% it's of revenue, but revenue is going up by 2.3%. So therefore, the operating cash balance should be going up by 2.3% a year. Because it's a percentage of revenue. So even though it's the same percentage, because the revenue is growing in our forecast right now, the operating cash balance will go up. All right. Now, back to this. That's the point about the model. So back to your question. And for anybody that's watching this, don't do what I'm about to do. But if revenue were to go up... 10% just by example, then you'll notice that this operating cash balance where is it here goes up a whole lot faster. Still 2% of a bigger number is a bigger number. That's our question. But don't do that because we all want it to be 2.3% and we all want to match for this assignment this number here. Oh, sorry, this number here. But that's the point. Go to TFI, take 2017, Copy it, go to column M, paste it, and just add our relative references for years equals previous year plus one. And you should have balancing TFIs through 2023. And the number that you want is 11,653. That should be your final TFI in 2023. Home stretch, CFI. Now that we have the income statements and balance sheets, take the 2017 CFI, copy it, go out to column M, paste it, and we now have forecasted CFI that more importantly balances through 2023. Then go to economic profit, BOY, take 2017, copy it, go to column L. This one tab, in all the other tabs, column B is a placeholder. This one actually starts with column B, so it's only column L. But for this one tab, when you paste it, just go up six columns. 2023, again, equals previous year plus one. We now have forecasted economic profits going through 2023. 
And for EPEOI, by the way, you should eventually get 32. For EPEOI, for 2017, copy it, paste it, equals previous year plus one, copy and paste over. This is now the EOI, which will be 29. And if you've gotten to this point, make sure you save this file because you have completed homework three. The which one? You want to see the screen? That's what you're saying? The end number you want is 29 on that tab. So if you're done with this file, this is half, well, actually three quarters of homework three because it's three points. And then the other one is to finish the PVH template, switch it to L brands, export L brands, get rid of the zeros, the dashes, or sorry, dashes, replace them with zeros, upload that file, and then you're done. Right? In previous class, people actually finished that before they walked out the door. Your job is to finish that by 10 a.m. Monday morning. This is an individual assignment not to be shared. Yes? Do you need us to change like the ROIC chart? Nope. So on Monday, we're going to pick up from this point exactly. So bring the file you submitted back to class because we're going to start here and then we're going to do the valuation. We're going to put it in Enterprise DCF. We're going to put in some more realistic forecast data and we're going to actually match PVH's share price. That's going to be called an as-is valuation. And then we're going to do what's called a target valuation, where we create a 12-month target share price. I'm going to talk to you about that process. That's next week. That's homework four. Okay? So homework three is to get to here. Monday and Wednesday, we'll finish, and that'll become your homework four. And that's basically will get us the reusable model, and we would have had, by the end of that, a more realistic valuation of PVH. This is very real. Okay? Now, <clears throat> final thing I'll mention to you as we wrap up, What's also key is check your CFI. If you got the CFI, that's typically a good way of checking any one of your models. Because if you don't have a balancing TFI, it's a problem. And generally, in order to get a balancing TFI, everything else had to balance. So, matter of fact, your midterm could have been really simple. I could have just asked for one number, your CFI. And if you gave me your final year CFI, I know you actually did the entire midterm right. But I didn't want to make five points of your semester grade on one number. That's why there was granularity along the way. But the point is, this is a good way of checking your models. So check your CFI. That needs to balance, and more importantly, if you got one 10.3, you're good. Just make sure you copy over the other columns because you'll need those to auto-populate. Now here's the interesting thing. I'll ask this one as a question because we got a couple minutes. Why does the CFI not change for these six years? It stays at 10.3 for all six years. Yet the company, and you saw this, is growing, making more profit, and generating a whole lot of cash. Why isn't the CFI changing? <clears throat> this, by the way, was a midterm question. And a lot of people missed it. You want to take a shot at that? Why isn't the CFI changing? Did we change the dividends? Did we issue or retire stock? Did we change the interest payments? Did we issue or increase new debt? Did we change any distribution to an investor? CFI stayed the same. If we didn't distribute any cash, where did all the cash go? If we didn't increase the dividends, if we didn't buy back stock, if we didn't pay down debt, where did all the excess cash go? Come on, guys, I just gave you the answer. Where did all the excess cash go? It went to excess cash. So that's the point. 
Excess cash is your proxy for distributable cash. That's the way the model's set up. Meaning, theoretically, whether you choose to buy back stock, whether you choose to pay a dividend, whether you choose to fund a pension, whether you choose to basically pay down debt, it doesn't matter. It just comes from the cash of the firm. And so what we're forecasting is the cash available to distribute, and that's key to enterprise value. What doesn't matter is how you choose to distribute it, right? So that doesn't really affect the value, the enterprise value. So when we value companies, that's the point. We're valuing your ability to buy back stock, we're valuing your ability to do dividends, and we're putting it in cash. We're just not making the, what I'll call, political choice of how to distribute that. That's a separate conversation. I'm not saying the companies don't spend a lot of time on that, but at least we know how much cash is available to distribute, and that'll be key to their share price. And that's going to be core to valuation. But regardless, that's why CFI is not changing. I'm not saying that we can't change it, but what I'm just going to tell you is if we start flopping the cash around, what you're going to quickly see when we do the model won't change the value. Okay? So whether or not we increase the dividend has no impact on the value of the company. Right? Because here's the point. The excess cash is the non-operating value. The operating value, add them together, is the enterprise value. So basically it's already built in there, and so paying out that distribution doesn't change anything. Right? In the real world, there's a perception issue, and that which would change anything, but technically, academically, it doesn't matter. So again, that was an essay question on the previous midterm. I might ask it again, because most of you are going to miss it again anyways, because you didn't read the book, but that's okay. That's what we'll get to for second midterm, to make sure you actually understand what you calculate. So back to this. Any questions before we turn you loose? Yes. So is there a video posted? I just recorded this as a video. I'm going to save this file and upload it to YouTube in just a few minutes. Any other questions? All right. So that's your assignment. Get it done by Monday. See you guys next Monday. We'll pick up from here. Okay. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your week. We're done.